Good morning, saints. Welcome to our service today at Spirit Word Ministries. Hallelujah. Another glorious day that the Lord has made from the foundation of the world. We do rejoice and we truly are glad in it. This is part 14 of our teaching, The Church Forever Free. <clears throat> part 14 on June the 9th, 2024. A couple days ago was my daughter Mercy's birthday. Today it's Anna's birthday. God bless you, Anna. We love you. And this is part 14 of this series. Again, The Church Forever Free, part 14 on June the 9th, 2024. A good day. Hallelujah. Now, last week, um, we're, we're going to, I don't want to do a lot, any type of a long summation because it's, I can't, you know, do a better job than what part 13 did, which I exhort everybody to go over again. Please, please go over part 13 again. <coughs> But what we did cover is something that we need to keep in mind all the time as a refresher. Let's turn into your Bibles of uh, Luke, chapter 22, verse 31. And let's look at this verse real quick. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Simon Peter, which is, you know, the apostle that was always a hardhead, <laughs> it seemed to be. He was Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you. Now, that's the case with everybody, to be honest with you. But the people who are not born again, he already has them. So they're not a threat to him. It's only the people who change and become new creations in Christ. He goes, he desires to have you. And in the Amplified, it says, have all of you, meaning all the disciples that were there. Amen? Hallelujah. That he may sift you as wheat sift you as wheat. Now, we talked about it last week, and I'm not going to be redundant, but the highlight I want you to take out of that is what is that sifting that the devil's looking for? You know, remember, Jesus came and introduced to the people who were under the law the person of grace himself, to where God himself in Christ would fulfill all the righteous requirements of that law perfectly on behalf of the people. Because mankind could not keep it. Jesus was the answer to man's inability to keep, uh, you know, a standard of law that only a God could keep. Okay, it was designed that way, that only a God could keep it, not a man. So it was, the, it was there, purposely made by God, to frustrate man so that he would come to an end of, him, of himself to reach out and receive the Lord Jesus Christ or the Messiah to be Savior and to save him from all those ordinances and such. So he says here, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. Now, <clears throat> you know, Peter wasn't the only one because it said, and he amplified all of them, which I would tend to believe would be all the rest of the body of Christ as well. If the devil's going to lose you to the born-again experience, and you're baptized and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and so on and so forth, the next thing he's going to do is, okay, you know, they're over into the Superman, God kind of class right now. So all we can do now, the next step that we could do is try to neutralize the Superman status that they are actually in. This godlike development that they've come into by, based on the Father, elevating us to a standard of excellence equal to that of his own righteousness. So that all is there, what we can do here is let's find out, you know, how they can depreciate and devalue themselves based on what they go through in life. Now, one of the greatest things that needs to happen to a believer after they're saved is to get their minds renewed to the Word of God, Romans 12, 2 says, right? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind. The renewing of the mind tells you what happened on the download that you got on day one when you got born again. On the day that you got born again, that God downloaded your whole destiny inside of your spirit. Everything. You, 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 you arrived on day one. <clears throat> now, you don't know that you arrived, and it, sometimes it takes a lifetime of learning, of renewing your computer, your mind, will, and emotions, your brain, okay, to what you got and what happened on the day you got saved. Amen? <clears throat> so, as you get your mind renewed to these things, the better, because the more you know, the less the devil can try to trick you. Amen? So, the next thing he did to integrate and try to neutralize all people is that the Gentile race, you know, the people who are non-Jews, 
<clears throat> they're not of the 12 tribes of Israel. He goes, let's get, let's intermingle the, the, you know, the Mosaic law that was only really for the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> let's have it go into the Gentiles as well so they can participate in it and basically cancel out any type of Superman status that they really have. Now you may say, well, how does it cancel out Superman status? Aren't they still born again? Absolutely. But you could have a 440, you know, roadrunner in your driveway or Super B or whatever you love or vet. And it's if you keep it in neutral and push on the accelerator, it's not going anywhere. Okay, it's only when you get some traction, okay, when you've got some power to be released from it that you can get some production out of it. It'll produce for you. <clears throat> Same thing, the church, they're this gigantic powerhouse, a recreated human spirit. Now that's in the God kind of class, the Spirit of Christ Himself, where God and a person of the Holy Ghost, okay, took up residence within you, and the whole Trinity is inside you right now. <clears throat> what, what more could we ever ask for? <clears throat> so the soul, the inner core, and the outer court, the flesh, still, the soul still needs to be renewed, and the body brought into subjection to what we're supposed to understand and know. So the devil goes, okay, let's let's take the law that Christ fulfilled perfectly and let them not come into the realization of it. I'm going to tell you how strong that statement was I just made. Even the Jews, who this was originally for, don't even know that Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly on their behalf already. They don't even know it, and they were the promised people at that time. So don't think that the church would ever know it. And one of the greatest mistakes that the body of Christ made, and especially through the echelon of the pastors and preachers is that when people got born again they handed them a Bible it says you know you really need to understand both these things and they mixed the two together I think what we should have done is handed them the New Testament and the epistles first said read up on this and now and then maybe a copy of the Old Testament later and said this is an historical account how God did all of his dealings with Israel and the 12 tribes Okay, now you can use some of the Psalms, the Proverbs, and all that for learning and growth and review the prophets and major and minor prophets to find out about end-time prophecy and such. That's fine. But the Mosaic Law of Obedience, Conduct, and Performance, you know, that was only for the 12 tribes because of the rebellion originally. Amen? So Christ fulfilled that. The devil goes, okay, so let's intermingle this to the Gentile church too. So even though they're Superman, they're going to go back under the Old Testament's precepts. And then what we talked about last week was the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, Are you an Old Testament person or are you a New Testament person? Well, if you're born again, you are a New Testament, new creation, a new species of being who now has a new identity and your union is now with Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. Now, if Satan knows it. Okay, more than you could ever dream that you know it, more than most church members know it. Okay, and obviously he doesn't want the body of Christ to come into the full harmony and conformity of it. Because if they ever did, even for one full day, the church knew what was going on, they could evangelize the whole world, the rapture would happen, and we'd go home. That's how powerful we really are. But to show you the strength of the neutrality of how he's neutralized us, he got this mixture in there of mixing law and grace. And now what we've been doing the last three or four messages is showing you how subtle this trickery was. How we, you know, by determinate, you know, circumstantial evidence that he makes a presentation to you by, how, what is your most immediate response? How you function after what you see will determine whether you're under the Old Testament and what you believe, or if you understand what happened and what you got conferred unto you as a believer in the New Testament. Now that happens 10,000 times a day. You may say, oh no it doesn't. Yes it does. Scientists say over 10,000 th thoughts go through our life. I, so most people get that done by noon. Okay? And decisions are made by then. So all those thoughts, if you don't think that the devil's involved with those, you're deceived already. But as you come into that conformity and keep beholding Christ. Now I keep bringing that up, this beholding thing. And we've talked about it in this series and also in the previous one in How to Cast Out Devils. <clears throat> that when the children of Israel you know, made that brass 
pole with the serpent on it, and they beheld it, and that, just by that beholding, they were spared death from the bite of Satan. Okay, the poison of those asps. The power of beholding is very strong and determinate within your spirit man, your inner man. And so when I tell you to continue to behold who you really are and your real identity in Christ Jesus the Lord, just by beholding him, he draws all judgment out of you. Just by beholding him, he draws all sickness and disease out of you. Just by beholding him, he draws all, you know, performance, conduct, and, you know, mixture issues and obedience things out of you. Okay? It keeps you centered on who you really are. All day long, you're going to have to make that decision. And I'm not going to, I know chapter, or part 13 has it all, and it does, really. When you go over it, you're going to see it again, okay? But it needs bearing of repetition because, you know, all, you know, as soon as the service is over, the devil's going to try to hop on the hood of your head and start talking to you about circumstances that are happening in life. But if you see those things through the lens of your new identity, that they're already pre-defeated on your behalf and Christ has already conquered them, and he's already made you pre-triumphant over any circumstance could ever make a presentation towards you, you got it made. You got it made. The key thing is to believe it, confess it, and don't budge off of it. Okay? I believe it. God said it. That settles it. Now that's where the rubber really meets the road. That, that separates reality from fantasy. Now what is truth? Absolute reality as it really is, and that's the Word of God. So when we talked about anything contrary to that is a lie. And that's a good thing to know. So 99% of the things that you're going to get off of TV, off of the media, is a lie. Because Satan is the god of this world system. And it's commerce, it's media, and everything else that he does. So expect that. But God didn't intend or expect him to become the, you know, the usurpers of the pulpits of, of America and the, and the whole world as well. But this mixture thing was a, was a no-low-level assignment by hell. They got it integrated everywhere. So it says here, he desired to sift you as wheat. Now the sifting is all about finding out which you believe. Do you believe that you're a New Testament believer or you're still pre- you could be saved, you're over on that side, but your thinking is over on the wrong side under the Old Testament still. A simple example is the devil puts a symptom on your physical body. How do, how do you respond to that? What do you say? What do you believe? That will determine if you're in mixture or determine if you are, if you are stable, fixed, and founded on your New Testament reality, so which you know is real and true to you. Do you say, geez, I wonder why this is happening? Lord, would you please, you know, get this off of me? You are fully in the Old Testament to make a statement like that. Because God's already at rest. In fact, he puts you at rest. And for him to undo an answer, which you just asked him to do, to do something about your healing, he'd have to undo the rest that he's in and the rest that you're in. Then he'd have to send Christ back down to the cross and already and re-die for you on that cross. That shows you the... the the, you know, the magnitude of what you just asked God to do. Lord, will you heal me now? He would have to send Christ to come all the way back down to the earth, re-die on a cross, and then go down to hell for three days and three more nights, raise up from the dead, take you again up there after you bore all your infirmities, carried all your sorrows, sickness, pains, and diseases, and then sit you down at his own right hand. Then two minutes later, you ask him to do the same thing. Then Christ would have to come all the way down and get crucified afresh all over again. That's all based on the fact that you are under the Old Testament thinking yet. The right response would be is, no, Christ has already defeated you. In fact, he was my substitute and I defeated you, Satan, in Christ. So you've got no legal right, you've got no lot, you've got no, you know, any type of legal avenue into my life. There's nothing in common in me that's in common with you as it pertains to this disease because my Jesus bore it on my behalf. I'm a new creation. I'm a New Testament person. I'm one who beholds the Master as my righteousness before you. You have already been defeated. I cast you out, and you're underneath my feet. That's the proper response. That's the proper answer. 
Amen? And that goes carte blanche for everything that goes on thereafter in that day. A negative report on TV, what a political issue is doing, what politicians are doing, okay? What are you going to do? Are you just going to cave into what is written by the devil or what is written by God Almighty through the Bible? Okay? And I'm telling you that we're not constituted enough to only hear at one time. That's why I say the renewal of the mind, faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. And while you're hearing it again and that message again, the washing of the water of the word has taken all the debris that you don't even know that's there and dredging it out. And it's rebuilding your, your consciousness to believe in the standing that you really do have. He desires to sift you as wheat, Simon, or the body of Christ. And he's monitoring all day long with the stenographers around your mouth, like you're in a courtroom, which you really are in a spirit world. And the stenographer is writing down every time you open up your mouth and say something. Then they know whether to sit as a squatter does on all your rights. It's all yours. You own your home, but a squatter comes in there and he can fight you tooth and nail, and you may lose for a year or two to, before you get this guy out. Well, that squatter can sit on your inheritance. That devil squatter can sit on all your rights, on your healing, if you're stuck in mixture. Because he now has a legal right to be there because you don't believe that Jesus already did it. You don't believe he bore your sin? You, didn't, you don't believe he gave you a standing of, of freedom, of righteousness and liberty? That he took all of your sickness and disease away from you? You don't have a clue. It's only, you know, surfacy. It's not deep. It's not coming out of your heart in conviction and might. Okay? With miracle working power and flow. So know that that's the devil's M.O. He's going to sift. So if you go into the day knowing, okay, the devil's going to do some sifting today, but I'm going to sift him because I'm going to teach him, a, I'm going to give him a Bible lesson and preach to him. Tell him you're already defeated. Don't you understand that God already put you underneath my feet and a defeated you know, position, a prone position of eternal loss? Don't you understand that everything that has a name, including the whole demonic host, God put it fit under the body of Christ's feet? That's where you are? And the Bible already says that you are a liar and a father of all lies. So no matter what you tell me, no matter how many times you say it, speak to the hand, you're lying. So now that I know that you're lying going in as you're trying to do your sifting against me, just believe the reverse of whatever he says. Okay? Believe the reverse. And sift him. Okay? I've looked at you saying there's nothing in common in you that's in common with me. I'm sinless and you're full of sin. You are the father of sin. I'm free from infirmity and you're loaded with it. I'm full of prosperity and you think that you got the wealth of this world, but right now the father and his angels are already tugging it away from you. And there's a great wealth transfer that God is preparing and already starting. He doesn't have anything common, saints. He's already defeated. Okay? So, you've got to be conscious of this. Don't just get up in the morning and do whatever you do. You go through a little routine and then you forget what man or man or woman you really are in Christ and God. It takes discipline and takes diligence to keep, the, you know, that's what disciple means. I'm a disciple because I'm disciplined into the things of God. I'm not going to lose track of my righteousness. Okay, now let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10 where we left off last week. Hallelujah. Now this, you know, one thing I want, I said last week, I'm going to say it again. Once you keep establishing your righteous identity, the devil's going to, you know, hang out for a while, see if you really believe it. But once you keep doing it, he's going to go off. He's going to lose that assignment, okay? And go harass somebody who has no idea what's going on. Another Christian who goes to a, a church that doesn't preach on your righteousness and sinlessness. He'll do it. Um, let's look at chapter 10 of Hebrews, verse 9. That's basically what we just talked about. This is what Jesus came to do. He goes, Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. This is Jesus talking. 
okay? Where my father, I'm paraphrasing this, he taketh away the first testament or the old testament, that he may establish the second or the new testament. Now we got into that last week in depth, so we're not going to do it today, but the key come, takeaway there is that the word taketh away. That's the takeaway. He took away the old. So there's no reason in the world for you to, you know, to delve there any longer, to believe there, to stay there any longer. That's not where you need to be. That's where the enemy wants you to be because you just basically threw out all your rights, or at least you suspended them for now. He said that he threw out the first, he taketh away, so it happened. So why would you dwell on something that doesn't exist anymore, nor have any force or effect or value to you? Now I told you you can New Testamentize the Old Testament by using Christ, okay? But you know we're going to get into that in detail, but not today, okay? Verse ten: By the which will we are sanctified, not on its way. Now there's a teaching out there that says you know that we're not perfect. In our spirit, you're perfect. Now your soul may not be there, have arrived yet. But it's going to take an eternity for you to really find out all the things of God. But this scripture here says, "But by the which will we are sanctified." It was done. It was a work done by God and not by man. Okay, that's good. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So you got clean, you got purged, you got delivered from your sins once and for all. So now if you go back to 1 John 1, 9, after you're a born-again Christian and reconfess your sins, you just blew up that scripture. You're now crucifying Christ afresh because you don't believe that he took it all away. It says once and for all. That means eternity. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 11 in the Old Testament it's talking about here, and those priests standeth daily. Notice that they're standing daily. Did you understand the power of that word standing daily and why they stood? They never got the job finished. It could never be completed if you're standing. When Ephesians 2 6 said that when God rose Christ and you and me up together, he made both Christ and you and me to sit down. Big difference between standing and sitting down. Standing means the work is not done, it's not completed, there's more to go. But sitting down connotates rest and there's nothing more for me to do. It's done for now and for all eternity and forever. See, you can't read the Bible like a newspaper. You've got to take each and every one of these words you know, and, and soak in them and have the Holy Spirit reveal what's going on here. And those priests stand at daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice for sin over and over, which can never take away sins. It never took them away. It only covered them up. It was one of the greatest cover-ups in history. It only covered them up. But it never purged them, never dissolved them, never eradicated them. Okay? They're still there, running around in that poor man's or woman's consciousness that they're still unworthy sinner. But, in verse 12, but this man, Christ Jesus, paraphrasing again, after he had, off after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Notice how those verses are connected. 11's talking about standing up, and the Old Testament, and verse 12 is talking about Jesus sitting down. Don't miss those things, saints. That's all the difference between you having victory and success or failure. Know that you're sitting down. Notice that God didn't make Christ to sit down and made you to stand up. Well, you got to do an, on an ongoing work to please him, to finish and make sure your sins have been taken care of. No, he made you to sit down too. You got the benefit of the of the high priest who died for you, Jesus. When he sat down, you sat down because there's not one centilia that you can add to the redemption that God already ordained for you to have by his omnipotence and strength and intelligence, not you. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, and you're sitting down in him at the right hand of God too, Ephesians 2, 6 says. From henceforth expecting 
till look at what it says there till his enemies be made his footstool now it's interesting that he put the word footstool there they said that's god's resting spot well it used to be only his footstool but when he made a, a body for himself a body he had prepared for him okay okay then that footstool is on our feet the feet are on the body now he's there, okay, I've done it all. Now that sitting down not only connotates rest, it connotates that I defeated the devil and all the works that he would ever accomplish or try to do against you. Okay? That sitting down also encompassed that. Not just your sin, but anything that the devil could ever concoct or try to array against you or somebody else or your country, for that matter. Okay? Now he expects all the enemies because there's nothing more to do. He's looking at the devil who's a paraplegic on the ground, okay, can't move, can't do anything. He's looking at you as like Superman or woman in himself and saying, why, why would I have any other expectation other than you crushing him over and over? No matter what he would come up with, why should I have any other realization? Okay, so go about and continue and about my father's business and take care of the enemy wherever he is and keep putting him back on their feet. He's, you know, he got away, but he's an outlaw spirit. You capture him and put him back in chains where he belongs. Okay? I told you, the whole redemption was fulfilled in Christ. But we're the ongoing completion of what he has fulfilled. Until the last person's born again, although it was fulfilled at Calvary in the three days and three nights, People are still being born into the earth that need to get born again. So we're the ongoing completion. We're finishing what Christ did for us and his fulfillment. We're the ongoing completion of what he's fulfilled. Not just getting people born again, but getting them healed too. We're the ongoing healing of that he completed or that he fulfilled. Look at, look at 14. For by one offering, not two, don't go back to 1 John 1, 9 ever again. For by one offering he hath, there's that word again, H-A-T-H, -H, past tense, it's already done, nothing you can do to add or subtract, he hath perfected forever them. The them that he's talking about is you and me. Now why, does he, why did he use the word perfect? Because the work was not only perfect, God didn't leave one ancillary thing out of place. He didn't forget one thing about you. The whole work was so justified and so perfect that God is, and his omnipotence would not leave anything that would open up a door where the devil could get you. But it's also, he used the word perfect because you are now in union to one who is perfect, Christ Jesus the Lord. God himself is perfect. And he says that now you are into that same status reign of perfection that God himself says. Now, if you don't believe me, and if we get there today, John chapter 17, verse 21, 2, and 3, all it talks about is how perfect we are in God, all how perfect we are in Christ. We have the same union and oneness as God the Father and Jesus has, and in the same status of perfection that they have. Now, what God, no, no, we keep talking about the church forever free. That's how free we are, that God himself would make you one with himself. You're as free as God is. How, how free is God the Father? How free is the Lord Jesus Christ? How free is the Holy Spirit? That's how free you really are. And the devil's put a con job on everybody. No, there's a scripture in the um, Bible that says that when people get to heaven, God's going to have to wipe away all of our tears. Now, a lot of people in, the, in tradition have said, well, those tears are going to be all the things that we could have done for Christ but did not do and and all you know all the things that we could have accomplished but didn't the people that may have you know we lost and didn't witness to and all that I don't think it's any of those things I think it's it's going to come down to where God's going to say this is what this is this was your destiny this is what you were purported to have done for me this is what you ended up doing for me and the, and the judgment seat of Christ, is, it says that, okay? And we're going to look at that difference and see and realize, oh my God, the devil conned me into thinking that I was not a superman or woman, or a super being. He conned me where, that I couldn't do that miracle, that I couldn't be what I thought my dreams could say I could be, that I couldn't accomplish having a mansion here on this earth, okay? 
Remember, the devil's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But what he tries to steal is everything that's within you that God has destined for you so that you don't ever arrive. You've got to realize, God, we're going to look at that and start crying and say, Lord, how foolish was I to believe religion? Okay? Verse 15, Wherefore the Holy Ghost is also a witness to us. Now, what did the Holy Ghost witness? What is he witnessing? He's witnessing the perfection of the finished work. Remember what I told you that the Holy Ghost witnessed? He saw you on the cross with Christ. He saw Jesus become utterly one with you to the nth degree, to where nothing was left of you that, he, that wasn't one with him. He consumed everything about you in your fallen state. The Holy Ghost witnessed that. But the Holy Ghost also witnessed the resurrection to where now we are everything that Christ is today. And we're to live our life out of who he is in his personal personhood of perfection. Uh, we're to live our life out of the victory that he's obtained for us. He witnessed that too. Now remember, I told you the Holy Ghost can never sanction a lie. So that's part of the sifting too, though. Okay, there's a, there's a godly sift that's holy. And the Holy Ghost is sifting, saying, do you understand your righteousness? Do you understand your identity? Do you understand who you're in union with? Does Christ have that disease? Then there's no way you can have that disease. It's impossible. You've got to come to that conclusion in your mindset. You can't be playing around with this stuff. If he doesn't have it, I can't have it, so get out! And be dogmatic about it. Don't put you know, pussyfoot with the devil and play patty cake with him. This is, this is for keeps, this stuff, saints. Okay? You can't be playing around with him. Either you are one with the Son of God, bone of his bone, flesh of all of his flesh, or you're not, and the Bible's a lie. Or it's really absolute truth, and the liar conned us again. That's part of the con job that we're going to cry about. Lord, why did that person die of cancer? Why did I, uh, why am I here premature? And he's going to show them, mixture got you. Okay? And you're going to show them, they're going to cry saying, I, I, I didn't have to go through that. I could have lived out my full course. I could have fulfilled all things in my destiny. And I'm telling you, the challenge is all day long. Always go back to truth when you're, un, when you're not sure or you're undecided what to do or what is real. Like I said last week, another, you look in the mirror and a gray hair, you, oh no. No, what are you going to do? Look to him. Does he have one? No. So then that thing's a lie. Then you attack it. I'm in the prime of life as he's in the prime of life. And you got scripture after scripture. These people live to be a thousand years old in the Old Testament. Or darn, darn close to it. Okay? We know they're going to live to be a thousand years old in a few years to our future in the millennial reign. So what the heck? The Bible says, as he is now, so are we in this world. Now, is that true? If it's true, then you've got to go all out. You've got to sell out to that, what that says and not believe anything less. I refuse to believe that I'm going through a premature aging. Premature is anything less than a thousand years. But it says in Genesis, though, that uh, by reason of, you know, man's not going to live to be over 120. That's not what it said. It's 120 jubilee years, and jubilee years are 50. A jubilee year is 50. 50 times 120 is 6,000 years, which is supposed to be the lease on man's existence. That's what God was talking about there. And the devil's soul of a lie. Okay? Now, he may have conned Adam and all of his descendants to get it down from 900 to 120 to 80 to 70 or whatever. <clears throat> but he doesn't have to con you, the devil. We are the descendants of the God of the dry bones. We are the descendants of the people who are in union with the Son of the living God, who is an eternal being, an immortal being, okay? which were bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Verse 15, 
that is what the Holy Ghost is witnessing. What are you saying? If you start saying, that disease has no part or lot on me, it's broken, its power has been broken, Christ bored on the cross and took it all out of me, by his stripes I'm healed and I cast that spirit out of me, the Holy Ghost witnessed that. He sifted you, he witnessed that, boom, the miracle hit you. Because he's the miracle of God. You gotta understand how the Godhead works. Okay? Father conceives a thought, tells the Son about it. Jesus takes that thought and speaks words. Okay, that's why he said the Word of God created the universe. Not the Father, the Word of God did Jesus. So he spoke these words out of his mouth. There's still no creation yet. The Holy Ghost sits there waits, waiting on the words of the Son. They know what they're doing. They know what their assignments are. And the Holy Ghost is the one who does all the manifestation of the miracles and the words of Jesus Christ. Now, we are in the person of Jesus Christ. We're the body of Christ. He's waiting. The Holy Ghost, God put the Holy Ghost inside you so you would be saying faith-filled words all day that he would brood over like he did in Genesis. He brooded over the words and waiting for the commands of God. And then in a second, he refurbished the earth. Okay? That's the power of the Holy Ghost. And the churches today, like I said last week, relegate him to the trunk of the car. And he, that, he should have been in the forefront of our lives. Okay? So the Holy Ghost is also a witness for us. For after that, he had said before. Now what was said before? Look at verse 16. That this is the covenant that I will make with them in these days, talking about our day, the New Testament days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And the law is not talking about the Ten Commandments there, because they already had that, and they couldn't keep it. The laws he's talking about is the law of love, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Amen? And then I'm going to put them in their, in their minds, too. I'm going to allow them, I'm going to open up the, I'm going to give them what? Revelation to their spirit and illumination to their minds. And I'll write my precepts upon them so that they're going, they can know me. 17, okay, he goes, I'm going to write them. God's going to write them. He wrote them when you got born again. Look at verse 17, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. <clears throat> if you remember your sins, you're under the Old Testament. Well, I, I know if I've sinned. Yeah, I know, we all know if we sin. But if you remember what we taught two or three sessions ago, Romans 8.3 says that God condemns sins right to condemn you in the flesh. So all the sins that you would ever make in your flesh, he's already condemned it. Now, does that give you the right to go around, like I've said before, as a wild man and just be a sinner all day long? If you're going to do that, I challenge the, the belief that you're even born again. Because eventually you're going to arrest yourself and say, what am I doing? Okay? And stop it. <clears throat> now, If the devil is wrangling with you, or you have a situation going on in your life that you a symptom that's really been, you know, trying to endeavor to impress itself against you, use two words, say stop it. Stop it. Stop it. And say it ten times in a row as loud as you can. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. And that thing will leave. I was talking about Gladys again from Nevada. She was doing that. That's things that were harassing her. The Lord just supercharged. She's been in the Word night and day. She's go she goes, she can almost recite any one of my teachings word for word. That's what I'm talking about, renewing the mind. Okay, she's getting tremendous results out there. And the devil tried to bring something up or do something in her, I can't remember, the. it's in the text she sent me or the email. But she said, stop it, stop it, stop it. And the devil stopped. It's the most important thing you can do. Stop it. And you tell the devil, stop, stop. Okay? And don't forget that. He'll stop dead in his tracks and get out. He's deathly afraid of you. He trembles at you. You've got to understand how much he does. He says here, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more in verse 17. 
How dare you remember them? Why could why would you remember something that the Father is not holding against you? Well, because I just committed it. Again, performance, conduct, and obedience is old T. It's Old Testament. You're going to live right because you believe right and you have a divine nature. You're always going to flow to the nature that's you know inside of you. That's why the Bible says, yield ye to the nature. Yield ye to the Spirit of God that's within you. You have to yield to it. Give place to it. Okay? Their sins and their iniquities all I remember no more. You do likewise. Your sins, your iniquities, remember them no more. No more. No more. No more. No more. Even in the face of contradictory evidence, even in the face where you just got done swearing, in the face of it all, I'm still the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That drives the devil crazy. He will leave you quicker than any... I mean, if you get that one down, he's gone. Now, he'll come back once in a while and try to, you know, interfere with you like you did Jesus. But just stop it. I'm still the righteousness of God. Righteousness means that I'm an Old Testament believing Christian. Okay? I'm a new creation. I know what I am. Because my Father is my standing before him. Well, I remember no more. Then you don't remember them. Don't remember them. Don't do it. Just simply say, Father, I thank you that I'm in the water for all the blood. That is a perpetual thing. I just thank you that I'm perpetually being washed and cleansed for I have an eternal righteousness. And that's what you see before the mercy seat. You don't have to get into anything about getting rid of them. They've been gotten rid of. You're just saying that to get them out of your mind, your consciousness. Verse 18. Now, where remission is, or this pardon of this is, there's no more what? Offering for sin. Now, I don't remember I talked about this last week. Again, you didn't do it. I don't hear anybody getting up, shouting, screaming, doing jumping jacks, somersaults, cartwheels. That's probably the most powerful scripture you'll ever read. Let's read it again. Verse 18. Now, where remission is, of these is these sins and iniquities is there's no more offering for sin you don't ever have to go back to first john 1 9 there's no more offering why because the first offering that christ did was more than enough it was sufficient enough it cleansed you more than enough amen you got that saints there's no more offering to go back to it was that powerful all-encompassing it got them all past present and most importantly, future. <clears throat> 19. Having therefore, brethren, now we have boldness, confidence, liberty, the margin says, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We're going right there. We're at the throne room. We're inside the throne room. We're sitting at God's right hand. I would climb on, on his lap and hug him. And he's got his arms wrapped around you. I can go into the holiest of holy. That's how pure this thing made you. It made you as pure as God is pure. And when you degrade that and you take away from that and say, well, I'm a sinner, you just called God the Father a sinner. You called the Lord Jesus Christ a sinner. You're saying that his work was not efficacious or strong enough to get rid of that one sin that seems to be dogging you. <clears throat> we'll come boldly into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, verse 20 says, which he has consecrated, okay, or made new, for us, through the veil, that is to say his flesh, his flesh did it by going to the cross, a new and living way, a new testament and living way. <clears throat> Verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God, Jesus is our high priest now. Where he, Remember the high priest's job was to do verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 was the high priest for the Old Testament, and verse 12 was the high priest for the New Testament. Jesus is our high priest who only had to do it one time. Your sacrifice for your sin. So now he says in verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance that I'm cleansed, full assurance that I've been pardoned, full assurance that I've been ransomed, full assurance that I've been integrated and connected and now in union with divinity. Amen? Full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water of the word. Now, remember what I said last week, having our hearts sprinkled, okay, from an evil conscience. The word evil there is the Greek word guilty conscience. 
Now we're free from a guilty conscience. No more guilt or condemnation. We're free from guilt. The guilt of it. Amen. 23. So now that we're free from a guilty conscience and we know that the blood and the water of the word has purified us. 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. No sense you oscillating back and forth, Old Testament, New Testament, anywhere. You stay steadfast to what you believe and to who you're one with now. For he is faithful that promise. He's a surety, Hebrews 7.22 says, of a better testament. That means he's a watcher over. And let us consider one another, it's talking about the last days here, to provoke unto what love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day approaching, he's talking about the second coming of Jesus. This isn't the day to walk away from churches, you know, in your fellowship with other believers. This is the day where you coalesce and come together with them. <clears throat> now, I'm glad there's a lot of churches in the area that are going through this hemorrhaging because they should have been closed centuries ago. But the true church, the whole church that knows what their righteousness is all about, you're going to start seeing them proliferate. Sure. Whenever you see a subtraction of one thing, there's about to be a springboard or spring and forth of a new thing imminently. Verse 26 is where we actually stopped. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now, wrong pastors and bad pastors use that verse against the church. They said, you know, now that you know that, you know, you shouldn't be doing this or you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be carousing around there or doing that, if you sin willfully after you've received the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice for sins or you're going to hell. That's not what that means at all. The whole chapter is talking about Old Testament versus the New. What is the choice that you're going to make? What choice do you, are you going to be grounded in? It says here, for if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth. What is the knowledge of the truth? The knowledge of the truth is verse 9. Let's look at it. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He, my Father, has taken away the first testament, that he may establish the second. That's the truth. Okay? That's the knowledge of the truth. What else is the knowledge of the truth? Verse 16, he would write, what? His laws in our hearts and minds. And verse 17, and his sins, our sins and our iniquities, would he remember no more? And where the remission of sin is, in verse 18, there's no more offering for sin. This He's saying, this, if this individual wants to go back under the Old Testament, back under the precepts of the law, and forsake and do away with Christ and all that he did for you, there's no more offering for sin for him anymore. Just like there's no more offering for sin for the believer, there's no more sin offering for somebody who would walk away and go back under the Old Testament. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about believers there. He's talking to the Hebrews here. Okay? So, uh, Amen? Let's read on here. Now, he's talking about what happens here to this person that would go back onto the Old Testament. How do I know? Because there's a comma after the verse uh, where it says there's no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for a form of judgment and a fiery indignation shall devour the adversaries. Why are they adversaries? These are the same adversaries that were Dog and Paul in the book of Galatians that you and I were talking about. He would go in there and give them the gospel of grace, and they'd come back in with the Mosaic law, and we'd get people back under mixture. Okay, verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Okay. I wouldn't want to be on that side. Look at 29. Hang on tight to this verse. Or how much more, look at this, or how much sore punishment suppose ye, you New Testament believers, now he's going back to us, okay, shall he be thought worthy, the guy thinks he's worthy by going back under the Old Testament. Can you believe that? Who shall trodden underfoot the Son of God, this is, this is the Holy Ghost speaking through Paul, when you go back onto the Old Testament and you love this mixture and you want to dabble with mixture and you want to play around with the Old Testament and call, remember what sin is? It's the transgression of the law, right? 
and say, um, I want to have both, okay? He says that you are trotting underfoot the Son of God. It's like taking Jesus, instead of hugging him, you throw him down and you stomp on him for an hour. You just keep trotting and trotting and trotting and trotting. That's what mixture is, saints. It's not a small, low-level thing. Playing around with this leaven, okay? Look at it, it gets worse. They're trodden underfoot the Son of God. They've counted the blood of the covenant that he shed at Calvary, the blood of the New Testament. It took God everything. It cost him his life to give you this. He's counting the blood of the Son of God of this covenant wherewith he would, where you were sanctified, set apart for God. You're counting it what? An unholy thing. See, if you go back under the old T, Old Testament, everything is now unholy. God made you holy with the new, but when you go and dabble back under the old and mixture, you're back to being unholy. You're trying to fit yourself into him, into union, to who's perfected you. Look at this. It gets even worse. An unholy thing, and you hath, pay H-A-T-H, done despite under the Spirit of grace. See, under the New Testament, we're under the Holy Spirit's jurisdiction and auspices. And it says here, you've done despite, you've despite the spirit of grace. Because you've told grace, you're out the window, I want to go back under the law. Here, here's what I think of grace. Overthrowing it, back under the law for me. Go ahead. You know what God said? Verse 38, 39. Look at what he said here. Now the just, the ones who wake up and understand who they really are in God and in Christ, the just, that word just there is the word, Greek word righteous. But the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, New Testament. Beautiful. But if any man draw back, draw back to the Old Testament. Okay, this is what the whole chapter is about. Old and new. Okay. If he draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. God doesn't have any pleasure under burnt offerings and sacrifices of the old tea. Only the one that Jesus did. Look at the last verse here, 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. You want to keep dabbling? Those guys who made a choice to go back under the Old Testament, they don't, they don't have a sacrifice for their sins, saints. Their sins did not get redeemed. And they took their names around to the Lamb's Book of Life. We are not unto them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. I believe what God did for me, and I'm not going to dabble with mixture. Now, do you see how true? tragic mixture really is you're hanging on you know on one hand you, you you would never directly trod the son of god underfoot you would never directly you know take the blood of the cross or the blood that he shed and just you know just despise it you would never despise his holy ghost that dwells within you directly but indirectly you're trotting you know it could happen the blood is an unholy thing and the holy ghost you're throwing out the window you can't do that. We're not going to do that. We're better than that. And that's why I said go over part 13, and I'm telling you, God wants this thing down. This is what he talks about in the book of Revelation. Come out from among them, my church. Come out from Babylon. Babylon means confusion by mixture. His howling to the church is still today the same thing. Come out from mixture. It's killing you. I'm not able to have my full pleasure about you. Make it's in saints. I'm telling you, it's simpler than what you think it is. It's simply a choice. It's making a determination of will. I will to make a choice to go after God and eschew and despise mixture. And through and God put the mighty Holy Ghost inside you to make sure you would not stumble and go back. Holy, just tell him, Holy Ghost, make sure I do not go back into mixture deliberately or even Ill, even unconsciously don't ever let me slip out of the hands of the father he says that we are be held in the father's hand nobody can pluck us out of his hand but ourselves if we want to go back to before the cross why would we want to go back under the jurisdiction and overlordship of the devil where he can hammer you into oblivion it's insanity saints that's why this teaching and the church forever free could be one of the best ones we'll ever do here. You know why? Because it truly sets the church free. That's why the title of the series is The Church Forever Free. That's what we really are. 
That's what real reality really is. Do you perceive it there? Do you see yourself there? Let's unhook. Thank you, Father, for this time. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you, and we adore you. Thank you, Lord God, for a glorious church that we have, that you have. Thank you, Lord God, for a church that is without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, or any such thing. Thank you, Lord God, that we are perfect before you in every, you know, any, any form, fashion, or mind whatsoever. Lord, there is nothing in us, Lord God, that is in common with the enemy. You said, Lord God, that in the body of his flesh, through death, he presents us now before you, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. That's where we really are, and that's the real you. You know, you know how I know? Because Jesus Christ is the real you, and you are the real him and him. He made you one with himself. That's real reality, saints. Always go back to beholding him. As you do that, it will keep you from trouble. It will keep you encased in his glory and his love and his power and his provision. All the days of this life, amen, and in eternity to come. So, Father, we thank you for all this. We praise you and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's prepare the elements for communion, saints. Praise God forevermore. I trust has blessed you today. If not, go over this message. <laughs> Praise God forevermore. Amen. <clears throat> now next week, ironically, we will be starting in John chapter 17, 21, 2, and 3. Now if you read that, those verses under the light of what you just heard, you really, you'll come to the, the true realization that, yes, Lord, I am the church. I can see now why I'm forever free. We you understand the depth of the union that you really have with God and Jesus. Praise his holy name forevermore. Thank you. <coughs> okay, saints. Take the bread. Father, we just thank you for this time together. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you and adore you. Lord, you said that when we come into come union, we come into union, when we see our union, that you reattach us unto you again, we see that the finished works of Christ were not only majestic and magnificent, but perfect in all respects. You brought us into the same union of righteousness, sinlessness, holiness, innocence that you have. All of it, Lord. We are truly the body of Christ. And being in this body, Lord God, we have a right to walk in your redeeming power. We have a right to speak words of grace over our country, over situations in life where your redeeming blood has given us your blessed day and overshadowed Satan's cursed day that he had marked, earmarked for us. Now we're under the redeemed day from the foundation of the world. And Lord, through the power of your word, we bless our nation, we bless Israel, we bless the city of Jerusalem, we bless our borders, Lord God, and you deliver us from all evil. Yes, you have delivered us, Lord God. And we send forth your word and heal all those who are in need of healing and deliver every one of them from their destructions because it's already done, it's already happened, already been earmarked into the annals of time. See, when your name got written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the beginning, everything else was already written in the Lamb's Book of Life too. Not just the fact that you're sinless, but it says that you're perfectly healed. So you may as well line up to how heaven's already recorded things. So every organ, tissue, and cell that you have functions in the absolute perfection to which God created it to function. Why? Because His done. Jesus' organs, tissues, and cells do. Therefore, I forbid any malfunction in our bodies now. In the name of thy holy child, Jesus. We have a genetic salvation. We have his prime of life. And as he is now in the state of absolute perfection, so are we forever. Amen, saints? Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, Burn it, etch it into our hearts, the revelation into our spirits, illumination to our mind, 
the gravity and the magnitude and the depth of which you accomplish for us. So Lord, we'll never, ever, ever shake back to and fro what is going on in our lives, what is happening in our physical bodies. For we are who he is today. The Bible says that he is truly now, not just in love, not just in sinlessness, but also in the healed, perfect, stable body, so are we in this world. If you believe that, you may partake of this bread and rejoice. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 You're doing. You take. You took that bread because you believed that you're one with the body of Christ Himself, His own body. You believe that He has healed you already. You believe that you'll not tolerate anything other than that union of perfection that you have one with Him as today. You believe that. God's word said it. I believe it. That settles it, saints. I'll take the cup. Now in this cup, that shed blood is, that is before the mercy seat of God for eternity, is an everlasting reminder that our sins have been eradicated, eliminated, purged, and God sees sinless, perfect beings. That blood is so powerful that it defeated the enemy utterly and paralyzed him. And that's why he said that we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. He's overcome because he's got no legal standing left. Hallelujah. That blood is again over our country, over Israel, the city of Jerusalem, over everything that we touch, do. It's over our cars, every road we travel. That blood is over all the work of our hands, everything we do and have in life, spirit, soul, and body, financially, physically, socially, and economically. Amen. We are in Christ's stead. His righteousness, his sinlessness, his innocence. He said that through the power of the blood, he reconciles all things back unto himself. And he's the great fixer. Yes, Jesus is. And we thank you, Lord God, that that blood is so strong, Lord God, that there's not a thing or a being in the universe that can resist it or, or who cannot be covered and protected by it. Father, that blood covers our eyes, nose, mouth, lips, fingers, and hands and protects us from COVID issues, variants, respiratory things, known and unknown. It protects us, Lord God, from uh, flus, bird flu, any other flu that's out there and any other virus X. No matter what the enemy can concoct, Lord God, we are sealed and protected and blood bought, blood washed, blood sealed by the Holy Ghost of promise. We thank you, Lord, for all that. We thank you, Lord God, that we lean on the blood, we speak of the blood, we cover ourselves with the blood, and we are ever conscious of our identity and what that blood has done for us by bringing us into union with the Son of the living God. We thank you, Father, for this, by and through the blood of Jesus. All of God's people said, Amen and Amen, and may partake of the cup. Praise his holy name forevermore. The saints, prepare your tithes and offerings now. Praise his holy name. Remember the three things that Adam lost in the garden. His spiritual life. He lost his the ability to walk in divine health which Christ has redeemed and stored, and he lost his provision, the prosperity in the financial realm. What we're doing now is blessing the Lord, naming our seed, planting our seed, and thanking him, Lord. Just the same thing. When God sees you in the Lamb's Book of Life, not only has your sin been taken away, your sickness and disease been taken away, and your poverty and lack have been taken away. And he sees nothing but prosperity and abundance there. 
that's absolute truth as it really is. You can't, you, the Lord always exhorts us in the Bible. He said, stop halting between two opinions. Choose one. Choose life. It's one or the other. If you say, yeah, I'm, I'm in billionaire status, but then I'm still struggling over here. Mixture. And if you offend in one, okay, we don't want to go there. Let's do our tithes and offerings. Father, we take this basket of our tithes and offerings and give it to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the apostle and high priest after our profession, after the order of Melchizedek. As Jesus takes this basket out of our hands, we profess and confess unto him that we receive a thousandfold blessing and a thousandfold return of all that giving now. The wealth of the wicked is being exchanged to us to just right now it's happening worldwide and say I'm a candidate for it. Amen. Amen. Today's our day of Jubilee. That means debt cancellation. Why? Because it's part of our redemption. All mortgage, credit card debt, school debt, college debt, and any other debt known and unknown has been redeemed and eradicated already. The silver, gold, and the th cattle of a thousand hills are ours, as well as all the mineral wealth, hidden minerals, hidden wealth, anywhere that comes to the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Command the wealth transferred into your hands now. Now, there's going to be a general wealth transfer, saints, but you can break out of the, the flow and receive it sooner if you release your faith for it. Okay? God's always honored faith. So, Father, we just thank you that we walk into this magnificent prosperity so we can get your word out and you can bring relief to the saints and the peoples. Hallelujah. The angels of Almighty God, they're mighty. The end-time angels that are anointed for end-time wealth transfer and prosperity to the body of Christ and the saints of Almighty God. You go to the northeast, south, and west to expect and unexpected sources and bring in the revenue to us right now. And I command unto you, money come unto us now, today, tomorrow, and all the days of our life receive the blessings of Almighty God to you and avalanches of abundance. Do it, saints. Believe for it, and it'll start happening. Hallelujah. It works. It works. God is good. Father, we just thank you for this. Thank you for the tithes and offerings. Thank you for blessing the people magnificently, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for supernatural, unexpected wealth, Lord God. We have it, Lord God. It's already our, been earmarked for us. It's already part of our inheritance, and we make that withdrawal now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> okay. I turn to your Bible, Saints, to Psalm 91. Prayer of protection. And this is protection from everything you may say, well, this is the Old Testament. No, that's why in the last verse, I knew testimonies at all. That word salvation means soteria. Jesus' name is also sal uh, salvation. And, okay, and that's why I broaden out this definition. Verse 1, Psalm 91. We who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall lodge, abide, and stand in the shadow of El Shaddai. We do say to the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, and my God, and Him do we trust. Surely He has delivered us from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He's covered us with His feathers, and under His wings shall we trust. His truth is our shield and buckler. We're not afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, or for the peasant that walketh in darkness, or for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at our side, and ten thousand at our right hand, but shall never come nigh us. On with our eyes shall we behold and see the reward of the wicked, because he's made the Lord, which is our refuge, even the Most High, our habitation. There shall no evil befall us, neither any plague come nigh our dwelling. For he has given his mighty angels charge over us to keep us in all thy ways. They shall bear us up in their hands, lest we dash our foot against a stone. We shall tread upon the lion, the adder, young lion and dragon, shall we trample in their feet, treading upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore have I delivered him. I have set him on high, because he hath known my name. He's called upon me, and I have answered him. I am with them in trouble, I am do, have delivered them and honored them, but long life do I satisfy them, and show them my continued, ongoing, everlasting, perpetual, and eternal salvation, which is our Jesus, our health, healing, 
wholeness, soundness, deliverance, preservation, safety and assurance, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Saints, I'm going to show you something. Look at verse 14 again, where it says, Because because he has set his love upon me, it's because God first set his love upon us, right? Therefore, not will I deliver him, has he delivered us? Where do you get that? Colossians 1, 12, and 13. He's translated us out of the kingdom of darkness into the son of his love, right? Look, let's go on here. It says in the Bible, I will set him on high. That's old news. I have set him on high. When he rose us up from the dead and Christ from the dead and us with him, he made Jesus to sit at his own right hand and he made you and me to sit in his own right hand. That's why when you hear me speak it, I said, he has set me on high. He has already set me on high. Okay? you got to make sure you new testimonies everything. Okay? Then it goes on to say, uh, because he has known my name, uh, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. Well, we know that to be true. While we're yet speaking, God's already answered. I will be with him in trouble. No, he is my rock and my refuge, and he's delivered me from all trouble, right? If I'm sitting at his own right hand, the redemption has already met that burden. Look what it goes on to say, I will deliver him and honor him. No, I have delivered him and honored him. We already delivered, saints. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my continued ongoing, everlasting, perpetual, and eternal salvation. Amen. So expect that. So you got to be careful what you read, or else you'll read yourself right back in the mixture. So that's why you hear me say it the way I say it. Hallelujah. Alrighty, let's do a closing prayer. Father, we thank you that the saints today are blessed, and as they depart from here, or wherever they're hearing us messages, either in the Zoom room or in YouTube world, we just thank you, Lord God, that as they go forth, they go into the power of the Spirit, that the blood of Jesus is over them, their cars, mercies, tender mercies, and abundant mercies, and traveling mercies, and the angels of God are above, beneath, and front, behind, and sides of their car, whether they walk or drive, and also over the unrighteous. For the heathen have been given unto us as our inheritance. And we thank you, Lord, for that protection for both. We thank you as we embark on this new week, Lord God, we do forth with an attentive ear, going over to part 13 and today's message, part 14, and let it be put down deep roots inside of our consciousness, Lord God, so we can walk free from mixture and walk into the free flow of God's inheritance and destiny that's already been bought and purchased for us to use and to walk in and to have. We thank you, Father, for all that. I thank you, Lord God, for continued breakthrough, Lord God, to, uh, for the revelation of all the evil that's been encroached upon us that not only they revealed, but they're torn down. And we also thank you for the reversal in the courts, for all those things that we've been seeing and the and, uh, inappropriateness of what has been going on. We thank you for mighty reversals. We thank you, Father, for all that. We give you the praise, honor, and the glory for the continued reversals of all things, Lord God, that are not of your will. We thank you for the breakthroughs in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Saints, there's one other thing, um, a good a good testimony was, um, I got an email from, I think the guy's name was John Gilmore or something like that, but he's on top of all the legislation that comes out of New York State uh, stuff, and every single um, piece of legislation that was uh, against us concerning, you know, in the VAX area uh, was defeated. Now, that's a miracle. You have no idea how much of a miracle it is because there's no, nobody on the other side. It's just all them. But yet God still stopped all that. So that's a miracle. And I praise my Lord for that. Alrighty. So I want to tell, thank everybody for being a part of our service today. Thank you for allowing Cindy and you and and me to be your pastors. Uh, thank you for your prayers to us and your continued support. Also thank uh, the Lord that if you need us for any reason, send an email, text, get a hold of us one way or the other, and we'll lift up and thank the Lord that your need has been met according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen? And we'll agree with you. And we thank the Lord for you. So I want everybody to have a full expectation of what you are today. Remember, go over the message, especially the beginning where it talks about you're a superman. You know, get that, in, build that into you. Go into life charging. Don't go into timid, you know, with, that, with an uncertainty about it. Don't just say, no, I am what the Word says I am. And I'm not going to shriek. Even shrieking, being timid, going the other way is part of mission because that's not how he is. Always go back to him. 
Go back to him. Go back to Jesus. And you'll find out who you really are in him. Amen? So, saints, until we see each other again next week, stay in his presence, peace, and rest. And may God's richest and best be yours. Jesus loves you, and we love you. And have a blessed week, saints. See you next week. Bye-bye now.